Okay, folks, here we go. We got about four things to cover this morning. All of them are subtle, so stick yourself in the eye of the stick before we start so you'll stay awake. But uh, the first one is, is I, I picked up on the Ramal the other day when we were gathering cattle and I was waiting. So I have, in fact, started the curb strap contact of the two rain. This came from a lot of sources for me, but what I stuck in my mind was when I read about the Californios, the Sons of the Dons. The Dons got the Spanish land grants. By the time they got them, they were old. So their sons are the ones that ran the ranches, did the day-to-day. -day. Okay, the natives by then, they figured out they were really good hands horseback, so that whole thing about they couldn't ride thing was over. But the point is, they would go to a canyon, like across the valley over here, that's a perfect example, and they would send 20 riders out on the outside and gather that canyon. And the idea was to bring the cattle down to the rodeer, which might be a spring, it might be a sycamore, it might be just a flat piece on the fl below the valley of the canyon. So the, the sons would send out the crew and then they'd sit under the, or stand under the oak trees and visit and uh, work on their horses, and their horsemanship. Okay, a lot of times there was sons from other ranches over there helping them. So this is how they got it started right here. Now the object is, is to get the horse to yield without moving his feet. So moving right along, we got an email we got to deal with. A woman named Rhonda. And this is a big item. We're going to go ahead and open this can of worms because it's real common. Rhonda, you're not alone. There's a group on Tuesday, but nobody ever shows up. They're afraid. Okay. I am fearful of riding again after a couple of falls. I can't seem to find consistent seat advice. 80% of the weight in the stirrups, question mark. 20% in the stirrups, question mark. Squeeze with the thighs, question mark. Don't squeeze, question mark. I'm just getting so uncertain about when all these different advices apply and getting more fearful, uncertain, slash, what I'm supposed to be doing. Okay. As usual, I have an opinion, so I'll share it with you. The number one thing you have to do first is decide what's your fear level. You know, Deb just got out of the hospital and the thing they ask you all the time, even if you're sitting in the waiting room, what's your pain level? And you got one to 10. Whining or smiley face? Okay, well, okay, what's your fear level? That's what you need to decide. Now, the next thing you got to do is look in the mirror. Because fear is a personal problem that you either fix or don't fix. There's no such thing as a little bit pregnant in this deal. So when you look in the mirror, you have to ask yourself, is it worth it? Am I so afraid that I hate riding and I'm trying to get past it because I love my horse? Okay. How bad do you want it? If you're so scared that you're scared to get on your horse literally and it makes you sick, well, you got a lawn dart or you can lead your horse around on walks in the woods like has happened to some people we know. Or you can go with my advice. One of the things about getting on a horse and you have a fear level and you ride with a group, that's your first mistake. And then you get with this group and you tell everybody, no, I'm working, you know, I've got a fear level and I'm afraid. That's not fair. That's not correct. You should not do that to the people you ride with. Why should they have to wait for you? and ruin their good fun ride because you're scared to go anywhere. So don't do the group thing with a lot of people. It's a two-sided coin. You're going to die and they're not going to like you. So the next deal is your options. Okay, if I was to help somebody, which I've done several people, I tell them, if you haven't got good breathing, this isn't going to work. So if you happen to hike and you have a stick, get in cadence with your hiking and practice inhaling and exhaling. Okay, if you don't have good breathing, that's, you can't get over your fear because the horse feels you hold your breath. Groundwork. Okay, 
we all know how long you should do groundwork. All right, different story. Now you have somebody with a really high fear level. So now that person needs to practice groundwork with the horse they're afraid of, presumably. And if they're so afraid they're scared of groundwork, then they need to get a horse old enough to vote. And that's the horse that you would practice groundwork on. Okay, now here's the, the hard part. If you want to turn it into a group and you know a human that you trust and is, is not setting you up to fail, then I think you should have the take the lesson from the professional or your helper. But my own personal opinion is, is you need to get out there and do your groundwork with your horse. The more groundwork you do yourself, make your own decisions, not anybody else's, you're going to start to build your confidence. Okay, the second thing, if you live in town, everywhere we go, there was these uh, therapeutic riding groups. And they have all these volunteers. Most of the volunteers are people that don't ride. Okay, you should volunteer and go help. You're doing two things. You're helping out a bunch of people that, and kids that need help to get their confidence up and to feel good and have a nice day instead of sitting in a wheelchair. And you, in fact, whether you know it or not, are going to start to get confidence. Now, here's a tough one. You can get on a horse, and I've done this with people, and you do like a sheep herder, and you put your halter on, then your bridle, you give me the lead rope, you get on your horse, and I lead you, and we walk. Okay, and then next Tuesday we walk again. And if, if, you know, this is, you can see where I'm going with this. So having somebody pony you means that they, in fact, if they know what ponying means, not throw the rope in the air and scream. It means they're going to dally up if things fall apart. That person can help you get your confidence back. Okay, then eventually you don't put the lead rope on. Now, the another option is to ride in the round corral. Same thing, if it's a horse you're scared to death of, get on some old dinger that's a gummer that's, that you can just ride around and start building up your confidence. But if you do that, you need to walk, trot, and lope. Okay, so now if it's the horse that you're afraid of, then get in the round corral and start working with it and walk, trot, and lope. All right, then you move out to the arena and you walk around and you walk around and you walk around and incidentally never ride on the rail when you ride on the rail it's like a horse show horse you're only riding half the horse if they ever took the fence down on a horse show horse he'd fall over so you ride 15 feet off the rail and you walk trot and lope okay once you've accomplished that go outside because if you don't lope in the round corral in the arena and your horse lopes outside, you just shot yourself in the foot. Now, what's happened in the evolution of this hand of mine on my right side is that you, you're hearing the cricket now, which means that the horse is giving to the bit so he can roll the cricket with his tongue. And I'm connecting the dots for him. And the movement of the bit is so subtle that I don't think you can see it. But what my point is, is that he wouldn't roll the cricket if there was too much pressure. So what he's doing is giving to the spoon. All right, another thing is, so that's the deal on fear. It's an option. All right, first we dealt with fear. Then it says a question, 80% of the weight in the stirrups. The only time I have weight in the stirrups is when I'm that much is when I'm riding two point. Okay, so... You should be able to ride by a person to me and just kind of take your toe and take their stirrup away from them. You just got very slight weight in your stirrups. And it's on the ball of my foot. Now we ride wide stirrups, so we've got more foot in the stirrup. If you got oxbows, it's a different story. I don't know anything about that. So it's not 80%, I can tell you that. It's closer to 20%. Okay. What happens is that 
say for example you're going out to go for a ride you raise your stirrups one hole you get to the apex of the turn you're getting ready to go home now you drop them a hole okay that's because you're walk trotting lope and then you're walking home so just do the math but it sure as hell ain't 80 percent the weight in the stirrups now squeezing with your thighs is probably the second dumbest thing you could possibly do now in liberty training which means no bridle no saddle no blanket no nothing okay those folks they are centered riders and if you ever want to see what a centered rider looks like that doesn't squeeze watch the Indian relay races okay you don't squeeze with your legs you will be so exhausted when you get back and your horse will be so dull after amount of time that or, both or of you bothered. are bothered and both of you be upset so I hope I answered a couple questions for you, Rhonda, but don't squeeze with your legs when you ride a horse. Squeezing your legs is usually a cue to go forward, and some people in town cue them to go backwards by doing it. But when you're just out riding, you got to relax. Separate your body, upper torso and lower torso. My upper torso tells my horse what I want. The lower torso gets the message and sends it through the bottom of the feet of the horse. Okay, if I squeezed with my legs, I would have a really bothered horse fight or flight okay our friend Bo up in Sterling North Dakota he's quite the craftsman and what we're gonna do folks is we're gonna I don't know the right word but some guys that are really handy that work on ranches and do leather work and they don't get to town well we're gonna put their leather work on our website or YouTube or whatever the hell you call this and these are things that you can't find in the western store all right so this is this is a pouch now when i my own personal one it's what i use for medicine okay well this one he's made it for medicine but you don't necessarily have to have that you can't see it but there's a flap inside there that turns out and you can put a bottle here and a bottle here so it can be an antibiotic or something or else it can be Jack Daniels and warm wine. I don't care. But that flap is really good for separating things inside this pouch. I'll open it again. All right, so there's your pouch. It slides onto the back billet, buckles up here on the D. And it's a no-brainer and it's got its... Uh, I forgot what you call this, but it, it'll flatten a, down. A gusset. It's got a gusset in it. It'll flatten down, stay out of the way, or you can get two large sandwiches and some warm lemonade in there. It's your call. Dog treats. Anyway, of course, Deb has to have dog treats, but uh, anyway, that's an item that we're going to offer, and Christmas is coming, so if you want one, just get a hold of Deb, and we'll get it to you. The second thing is, is that there's a... A man riding for the five dot and he's a he makes beautiful he does beautiful leather work this was a martingale that he made I did some trading for it and then Chris bought me the concho for my birthday so what my point is is this is double layered sewn Fan. edged borderline bragging and he's up on the five dot. And if anybody knows the five dot, they're scattered from hell to breakfast. So these are two items so far that we have from people that are on ranches working. And uh, we're trying to support them and show off how good of hands they are. And now there's also one last thing, and I'll quit babbling, is that I've got a list. I made it the other day in the waiting room. Now I know why they call them waiting rooms. And... Um, People a lot of times ask me who were my mentors and who did I learn from. Well, the fact is I worked all over the West and I met a whole bunch of people on ranches. So what I did was I wrote down a list, not in order by no means, of people I thought about that when I was cowboying showed me things. It might be one small little tiny thing, but it helped my career. And what I'm going to do is we're going to break it up and then Deb's going to put their names in last place I knew them living. 
And if you do me a favor, any of you folks, especially you coffin cheaters, if you happen to know him, maybe you could send a message to Deb and say, this guy is so here, uh, we buried him last spring or whatever. I just like to keep, you know, life's getting to be more cherished all the time. So I'd like to kind of keep a handle on these folks because they, they really made a difference in my life. So I, and uh, one, you know, we would just like to tell you again how much we appreciated what everybody did for Deb. She's not kicking over her head, but she is out walking every morning and she looks great, feels great and gaining. So that's good news for us. And thank you to everybody for thoughts and prayers and everything you did. Adios. Thank you.